Hello, this is Jim Van Hackeren. Um, I am uh, a member of the Sheboygan Sustainability Task Force and also Maywood Park, uh, their friendship organization. And I'm here with Ross from Veta Boat Company. Uh, you can see this beautiful boat behind us, and it's an electric boat. And Ross, can you tell us a little bit about Veta Boat Company? Sure. Actually, it's two businesses. Uh, one is Vetacraft Boat Company. We are building classic boats inspired by the classics. If you know Chris Craft, if you know Riva, very classically inspired modern technology, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of technology in. We are doing autonomous navigation. We are also building uh, electric outboards and we're doing uh, full autonomous capability. Think of a autonomous cocktail cruiser on the water. So how did you get into this business? I grew up around the water and uh, really it was a couple of years ago, there was a company, it was a retro boat company in Saugatash, Saugatuck, Michigan, where my wife and I did a cruise on an old outboard, something like this. And I said, at some point, I want to turn this into a business. And why electric rather than a gas powered boat? So, so for me, if, if I'm in my vehicle and I go up to a pump, and I spill a little bit of gas, I'm upset, but not horribly upset. If, if I'm in my boat, my boat's on the dock, and I'm filling up with gas, and a few drops of gas spill into the water, and it plumes everywhere, I've just said, that's absolutely horrible. So I'm like, how can we, how can we do something different? For me, you know, I've, because I've grown up around water, I've always been inspired by getting rid of that problem. Okay, well, thank you for All the right, information. Keith is here from Arch Solar. Keith, could you just describe the business of Arch Solar? What does Arch do? Arch is a solar installer uh, at various levels from residential to commercial to utility scale. So we do a wide range as far as that goes. Um, so pretty much any residential or any solar system you need installed, you can give us a call. And, and where is Arch Solar located? Where are they? Plymouth is our headquarters, our main office in uh, Warehouses in Plymouth, but we also have offices and warehouses in Milwaukee and Madison. And why, why would you, why would somebody, why should somebody go solar? Well, I mean, there's the, obviously the environmental aspect of it that a lot of people want to do, and I appreciate it. But it's also becoming more and more um, to the point where it makes financial sense for a person to move forward with solar, where they can get a, a quicker return on their investment and generate their own power and have um, be in control of their own electric essentially. And what Arch Solar brought some vehicles here today. Uh, what type of vehicles did you bring? That would be this guy's uh, as far as we got the Tesla Cybertruck right okay. and we get a Y3 and an X. Electric vehicles how does that relate so to Arch's? We business? also install um, EV chargers is part of our business um, and oftentimes the two go together where somebody's interested in solar they're also interested in EVs and then that obviously leads to EV chargers as well so we install EV chargers for a, a lot of our customers and as a business does Arch use EV vehicles uh, yes so we have some as far as management has some EVs and we have EV chargers out at our office in Plymouth uh, where our employees and even other people can just pull up and charge their vehicles. So you have an outdoor charging station that Correct. even the public can come and use? Correct. And if somebody from the public wants to use an EV charger, what do they need to do that? Uh, well, what do they need? I mean, outside of being able to just plug right in, we have a standard, I believe, uh, universal type plug-in. Okay. Um, so you don't have to have a particular type of vehicle. Okay. So. Um, I guess you just kind of roll up and you just plug it in. And what would it cost them? Uh, for them, in that situation, nothing. Just because Arch yeah. is providing it? Yeah, because we have, we have a ton of solar on top of our building, or our, our office out there, and that feeds in and that offsets what people are um, consuming with their vehicles. We are very excited. Um, there's some great energy here today, pun intended. Um, <laughs> This is a new program, so we're, we're very excited. This, uh, the concept and focus on sustainability really fits well with our mission here of creating environmental stewardship. So we're, we're really happy to host this event. This event is a really great partnership. We really appreciate all of the sponsors, the partners, 
uh, the volunteers that are making today happen, and of course our panel speakers. Um, so we're very, very excited. Um, I want to give a, a shout out to Arc Solar. We really appreciate their support and sponsorship here today. Um, we've got uh, Trek Sheboygan, Glacial Lakes Conservancy is another partner, Green Bicycle Company, and of course the City of Sheboygan and their Sustainable Task Force um, and their focus on transportation and green transportation here today. So very excited and appreciative of everyone who made this possible. Thank you again for being here. Um, and I am happy to turn it over to our moderator, Mark Mahoney. Uh, yeah, I'm a volunteer, the, the, the Sheboygan uh, Sustainability Task Force appointed by the mayor is really the one that organized the event and pulled, pulled the great vendors and all of you together. So I'm part of that committee and uh, and again, I'm the moderator, and I'm, I've already taken up enough time probably from our speakers. So I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Adam is from Green Bicycle, is the first speaker. Go ahead, Adam, and introduce yourself and tell us what you know. Thanks a lot. I'm Adam DeSombre. I'm here on behalf of Green Bicycle Company. Uh, my wife started this business three or so years ago because uh, she's passionate about sustainability and bicycle commuting. Um, so 10 minutes isn't a lot of time to talk about e-bikes, and so I'm just going to give a, a brief uh, synopsis. But if you want to talk more, I'll be outside um, for the rest of the day or take a card, send an email, stop into the shop, and I'd be happy to chat uh, quite a bit more. So what is an e-bike? Well, it's just what it sounds like. Really, most e-bikes are just regular bikes equipped with a motor uh, and battery system. Um, when you're talking about e-bikes, uh, the first few considerations oftentimes you have to think about and what makes one e-bike different than another. Uh, the first really, the important one is the, the motor type. Um, either there's kind of two classes, there's mid-drive and then there's hub drives. Uh, the hub drive is basically, there's a motor in the most often rear wheel, right at the center at the hub. And uh, in a mid-drive, the motor is in the center of the bicycle where the crank is. Um, there's a few differences in those. Um, with the mid-drive motors, uh, I think there's a little bit more of an opportunity to have some te technology built in there for torque sensing and such. So oftentimes, it seems to me, uh, the application of power as you pedal is a little bit more intuitive. Um, some of the hub drive bikes I've ridden, um, they seem uh, a little bit more uh, impulsive, if you will. Um, I think oftentimes the mid-drive technology is a little bit more expensive. Uh, so if you're, you know, when you're thinking about buying an e-bike, you're looking around. Uh, if budget is a big, con big consideration, you might be looking more at the hub drives. And I'm, I don't want to diss hub drives, and there's a lot of great hub drive bikes out there, and we used to sell them too. Um, but with a, hub, with a hub drive, basically you have to adapt a wheel to accommodate the motor. But with a mid-drive, you basically have to adapt the entire bicycle frame to take on the motor. So it ends up being, oftentimes being a little bit more of a um, pricey endeavor. Um, so after you look at the, the type of motor, the next main consideration really is what class, right? And the class sort of is determined by like how, it, how much power it applies. And, and how it applies it. So there's class one, class two, and class three. Class one is a pedal assist, uh, meaning you have to be pedaling for the motor to kick in. Um, and in class one, the motor, the, as you pedal, the motor will continue to apply assist to you up to 20 miles per hour. Um, class two is like class one in that there's a 20 mile per hour cutoff, but there can be a throttle button. So if perhaps you want the option of not having to pedal, you can hit the button on a class two and it'll take you right up to 20 miles an hour. Um, there might be some effects on your battery life if you are relying exclusively on the battery to do the work, but the option's available. Class three uh, really are only available as a pedal assist um, and they go up to 28 miles an hour. So you have to be pedaling, but it'll continue to apply assist to you up to 28 miles an hour. Um, in our shop, we sell Gazelle bikes and right now, Gazelle only makes class one and class three. Um, Heather's philosophy is we want people to experience riding a bicycle and it feels more like riding a bike when you have to pedal. Um,
but uh, Gazelle does make bikes in class one and class three if uh, you're interested in those. Um, charging your bicycles. So a big part of an e-bike is a battery, right? And the batteries are uh, often large and heavy, can take up a big part of the mass. Uh, the bikes we have outside, the battery is probably 10 to 15 pounds on a 50 pound bike. So they're substantial size. Um, the size of the battery and what's inside sort of determine how much range you get on your bicycle. And that's sort of measured in watt hours. So when you're looking at e-bikes, you know, the oftentimes they'll start 300, 400 watt hours and the, the longer lifetime batteries will be five, six, or even 700, seven watt hours. Um, when you charge these, oftentimes you have multiple options. On the gazelles that we sell, you can either charge them on the bike or you can disconnect the battery from the bike and bring it inside um, to charge. But really, you charge them just like you would charge your laptop. You have a, uh, an AC to DC adapter that you plug into the wall and just plug it in. And uh, typically, you know, four to eight hours, depending on how low the battery is and how the, the size of the battery, you're charged, topped off, and ready to go. Um, uh, when you're looking at uh, your e-bike as a system, what you're interested in, there's several different plate locations you'll find the batteries. Uh, some of the bikes that we sell have the batteries in the tube that goes down from the handlebars to the, uh, to the motor, if you will, to the crank. Um, that's kind of a nice feature because the, the weight of that battery is underneath you. It's sort of in the center of the bike. Uh, it's nice for balance. Uh, sometimes the motors are, or the batteries are located on a rack on the back of the bike, uh, which is nice too. It's kind of easier to access oftentimes if you need to take your battery on and off. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you can feel that weight on the back of the bike more. Um, so for a city bike, maybe that'll be a more common thing. But if you're looking at an e-mountain bike or an e-road bike, uh, almost certainly your battery will be in the, in, the, in the frame of the bicycle itself. Um, let's talk a little bit about range. Uh, so I've got some stats in front of me. So for a 400 watt hour battery on like one of our Bosch bicycles, it lists the, the max range is 65 miles an hour. So this is a smaller size battery, but when you're looking at a listed range for an e-bike, oftentimes that's uh, presented in the most conservative riding conditions, right? That's gonna be your best case scenario. Most e-bikes will have a, a, a series of power settings you can use uh, on our Bosch equipped systems. Uh, that would be eco mode and there's typically four eco sport touring and then turbo mode uh, the more assist level you're using the faster it'll bring you to that max speed but also the lower your battery life so for instance on this uh, 400 watt hour battery where the max range is 65 miles an hour or uh, 65 miles uh, you switch it to tour it'll get you there faster but your range is 40 miles an hour Sport, sport would be 30 miles an hour. If you're in turbo mode, which brings you up to 20 miles an hour right away, uh, your battery, expected battery life is 25 miles an hour, so less than half. So a lot of your range is dependent on how much you're willing to help with the bicycle. Most e-bikes will have, you know, like I said, it's a motor on a regular bicycle. They'll have some sort of a transmission, you know, like a derailleur with a set of gears. Um, and the more you ride your bicycle, like you would be riding a regular bicycle, uh, the more range you'll get. So meaning, you know, start in a low gear as you pick up velocity, switch to a higher gear and do, do some of the, and do some of the work, um, you'll find your range uh, increases dramatically. Um, Bosch equipped systems like we sell, they have an action, actually have a really interesting web page you can go to where you can plug in your bike, what kind of battery, what your weight is, you're carrying any cargo, what's the weather, what's the temperature, what's the wind like, you know, like it'll give you an estimated like, okay, this today, based on your set of conditions, what mode you're gonna use, uh, this is what your estimated uh, uh, battery life should be. So that's a pretty cool feature. Uh, maintenance, you should handle your e-bike like you would an acoustic bike, if you will. Uh, really, the most of the electronic components, you don't have to service too much, especially in like the Bosch systems that we use, but like for any ride, check your tire pressure, you know, check your cables and connectors for wear, make sure your brakes are operational, you know, regularly charge your battery, um, lube your chain. Also important, bring your bike into your bike shop for maintenance. I would encourage people to buy bikes at bike shops because oftentimes it can be difficult to find a bike shop to work on a bike that say comes from the internet. Most people will only handle the bikes that they sell, or at least with the batteries. Uh, Cause there have been some issues in places where uh, batteries that have been 
you know, who knows what's been done with them, who knows the manufacturing, they've caused fires and, and cost lives. So most bike shops won't take uh, batteries that they haven't sold or aren't, perhaps aren't part of a component system that are on the bikes that they sell. Um, so bring your bike to the bike shop. For us, if you bring one of our bikes in, we sort of plug it into our Bosch diagnostic system. It runs a diagnostic and all of the motor, the battery, the computer system. Uh, if there's any codes, you know, it'll let you know what's going on and you can, uh, can work on it. So the maintenance is pretty much just like a normal bicycle. Um, so what's the reason to have an e-bike? Really, it's like it can sub for a, a normal bike. Like say you're a bicyclist and you just want to like be stronger. You want to feel like Lance Armstrong all the time. That's what an e-bike will do, right? It's 20, it's 20 year old you, but also stronger than that. So it's, it's great. But also it can be a substitute for a car. You know, if you have a two-car family, maybe you want to get down to a one-car family. Uh, that stuff's a lot easier with an e-bike because with an e-bike, they're robust. They oftentimes are built with cargo carrying capacity. You could have your e-bike for running trips to the grocery store, and those things, are, you're much more inclined to do that uh, if the bike is helping you. Um, it, it really takes no effort to do. So, you know, get rid of a car that saves you some cost. It's better for the environment, right? Like transporting one person to a store or to the post office running an errand in a vehicle, uh, the amount of energy spent relative to the amount that you've got when you charge your battery, it's dramatically different. You get some exercise along the way as well. Um, you aren't contributing to traffic problems, right? Like uh, the fewer cars on the road, the better it is for everybody, the better it is for bicyclists for sure. Um, bikes are more maneuverable. You get in places where you couldn't otherwise. Um, uh, some families are known to, uh, say, get rid of one of their cars and then more, maybe both cars. And depending on your community, uh, there's car shares and rental cars and people live a completely bicycle free life where Heather is right now. Uh, she doesn't have a car. There's a car share program. She can use one when she needs and she gets around just by bicycle. Um, uh, another option about e-bikes, say you want to go somewhere, but you don't, not comfortable with certain parts of town. Most public transportation now can handle bicycles. So they'll oftentimes have bike racks on the front. So you could put your bike rack on the front, get you to the outside of town, and maybe get on that trail you want to ride on. Uh, so that's one thing to think about too. Um, you can ride e-bikes year round. Uh, you can ride them in winter. Uh, it's recommended not to keep the battery stored at cold temperature. You can, but most times you can disconnect the battery from the car and bring it in. Um, riding in winter, you just need to dress warmly. Uh, if you're going to be riding a slush or ice, there's special tires made with knobbies on them and studs to uh, give you more grip. Um, the real thing is uh, just make sure you protect your battery and bring it in when you're done. I see uh, our moderator is standing up, so I think I'm going to have to, s to close her down. Like I said, you could talk about e-bikes for hours, so if uh, anybody has any questions, you want to touch base, you're interested in talking more, meet me outside or stop in the shop sometime. Yeah, Thanks a lot. Um, Linda Schumann, um, I envy people who can get up in front of an audience and not read from a script. So I have to apologize that I'm, I have to do that. Um, also, I have some fact checks and uh, myths that I have printed out here. If you're interested and want to find out a little bit more about what is misinformation about um, electric vehicles, feel free. Uh, I have a Tesla parked out there with copies of this in them, in it as well. So, okay, with that, uh, I'm, again, I'm a Linda Shimon, and I'm an owner of a 2019 Tesla Model 3. Uh, I purchased it in, uh, when it was still $35,000, uh, but I did add self-driving to it. Um, I've, I've tried self-driving, but I'm not comfortable with it, so... But um, anyway, I purchased the 2019 Model 3 Tesla mainly for the op absence of emissions, but also to provide capital to EV manufacturing and accessories to EVs, uh, to use this money to produce ever more efficient cost-saving vehicles. Uh, also on my mind was the price tag. It started out at 35K, which is high, but I thought a price I could reasonably afford given how the vehicle would be emission free, which is my first priority. When you think of every gasoline powered car on the road right now, if you park in the garage, 
uh, close the doors and let the car run, you've got a problem if you're in the car. Um, I can do that with my EV and there's absolutely no worries. Uh, I found that how to charge an EV is a nuanced decision. Uh, first, when I'm city driving, I keep my battery charged between 20 and 50 percent. Uh, that will reduce the stress charging will put on the battery and it extends the battery's life. The battery stress level rises as it approaches full charge. Also, I have invested in the convenience of a charger located in my garage. I find that very convenient, especially on cold winter days. More on that in a minute. Uh, also, I found that when I do drive to a location where I need to charge using a supercharger, for example, for example, when I drive to Madison, that if I choose to top the charge at 100% while I'm at the supercharger, that last 5% could in itself take 15 to 20 minutes, as opposed to charging from where I'm at to 80% might take 15 minutes. So uh, the metaphor I use for, it's like pouring water into a cup from a pitcher. If your cup is empty, you can pour it more quickly. But as the cup fills with water, you have to pour more slowly so you don't cause overflow or spill. So same thing with doing, uh, putting electricity into your car. Now there are pluses and minuses regarding dining while charging when on a trip. It's very convenient and it's advertised as a way to entice people to buy an electric car. So don't worry about the time it costs, the time you have to sit, the time you have to wait for the charging. Go have a snack someplace. Um, now there are more electric cars on the road, however, and what happens is there might be, you might be in a, uh, at a charging station that is very popular and very crowded. So what Tesla, for example, will do is if you put, if you plug in to the supercharger and you go in and have a bite to eat and your car is charged to 100% while you're eating uh, and you don't go out and unplug, you could be charged a dollar a minute for every minute after you hit 100%. So that's an added cost that you might not be expecting on your charge card statement. So that puts a little bit of a problem when you're, while you're enjoying your meal because you're constantly looking at your app because your app will tell you just how much time you have left before you hit a super chart before you're f fully charged. So while you're talking back and forth, you're like, which doesn't help, doesn't help your conversation. Exactly. Check, well, check, well the, the app will tell you whether you're 80%, 90%, 98%, 99% charged, and you go, uh-oh, I've got, it's probably in the next minute I'm going to have to get there, and I, it's a, it's a two-minute, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so everybody just sit here at the table, I'll be right back, and then you have to go find a place to park, you have to unplug and then find a place to park, so it, yeah, it's, it's not that great, so keeping it, Keeping it charged to 80% only keeps the time charging down to about 15 minutes, which is about how much time you end up spending to, uh, filling up at a gas station because you do other things besides gas. You go in and pay for it, or you use the bathroom, or you buy a snack or something, and that's about 15 minutes, something like that. Um, also, one does, does not have to buy a Type 2 charger, which is what I have in my garage. I have a, t I have a Tesla charger. So if I have maybe four hours worth of, of, tes of, of using a Tesla charger, it might take six or eight hours if I plug it into a 110, into just a regular outlet, which you can do. There's no, if there's no problem. If, you, if you're okay with overnight charging, just plug your car into the same outlet you would plug your phone into and go in and enjoy an evening. You're all ready to go the next morning. Uh, it is better to keep your car plugged in when the temperature is below 40 degrees. The batteries do not like cold weather and have their own way to keep the batteries warm, but that takes internal charge. If you plug in when your driving is done, the charge you left the car with will be the charge when you return. But if you don't plug it into the grid, the battery is now going to be using the internal charge, so you will have fewer miles to go when you get back in the car the next morning. 
when you're on a trip, the driver uh, will use a touch screen. Well, well, you don't do the touch screen while you're driving, uh, which is a Tesla's dashboard to plan for charger stops. That way the driver will know beforehand which superchargers are in the range that you have left, for, uh, how much charge you have in your car. Um, uh, for the miles of batteries, meaning whether you can have enough charge to get there along the route and details like how many chargers are at each location, how many of those chargers are not accessible due to damage, if it's crowded and maybe some are not available, maybe not all chargers, maybe there are six chargers there and all six of them are in use, so you're going to have to wait for a while. You get all that information from, uh, from your dashboard, from your touch screen. Finally, the driver um, is, if, if the driver is leaving for a trip, you, you'll be using a supercharger. Uh, it is best to program that supercharger stop into the navigator's uh, navigator system. If you use the in-car navigation to route you to the nearest supercharger, the car will automatically warm up and precondition the battery during your drive there. That shortens your charging time even more. Uh, getting away from charging, another issue you want to know about is updates and recall. Recalls to the car systems. Updates to the car systems and any recalls mostly happen via Wi-Fi. I, wi I have a Wi-Fi system in my home and one in my garage just to make sure I'm always easy to con easy, it's always easy to connect. Uh, in the five years I have owned the car, only one recall actually needed a technician, and the technician called me, made an appointment, then did his magic during a home visit while my car was parked on my driveway. Uh, number four, there is a misconception that owning a Tesla means that full self-driving is always on, and that's not true. Um, I chose to turn my self-driving off. I gave it, a, gave it a whirl in city driving, and it wanted to go different directions than I wanted to go, so I went, oh, I don't like this. And then whenever you turn it off, it says, why did you turn it off? And I'm like, I don't want to keep talking to my car, so... so. More planning must be done when driving when the temperature is below 20 degrees Fahrenheit because you use 25% more charge for two main reasons. One, the batteries are keeping, having to keep themselves warm. You don't have an engine that is warm keeping itself warm because it uses fossil fuels. Two, the driver is using more charge to keep himself or herself warm. In, in, the, um, in the compartment, in, in the uh, compartment area. Neither is an issue with the gas power car, again, because of the heat of the engine. And finally, when I notice that I will be passing pedestrians, I'm always very cautious because my car is older and does not have a feature that you can turn on sound so that as you're driving under 10 or five miles an hour, your car will make some kind of a noise of some sort. So a pedestrian who is busy looking at their phone or thinking about the next best political thing that's going on um, may get into the crosswalk prior to looking to see if any cars are coming because they're used to listening for cars and they cannot hear my car. So I have to be very, very careful with, um, with that to make sure that people know that I'm there. Uh, sometimes when I've stopped, people just go, oh! What's, I think it's because of the car. I'm sure. I think so. Anyway, um, again, I invite you, if you if any fact-checking or myths that you would like to kind of glance at, I've got the printed up here. In the meantime, next on the line. Hello, everybody. My name's Taylor. Um, oh, let's give a round of applause for Miss Linda. Um, I work at a car dealership. I'm also an EV enthusiast. I drive a couple of them. Um, I've owned them for the last six years. I have approximately 150,000 miles in EVs. Um, maximum of about 80,000 on one of them before I ended up selling it just because, well, who doesn't like to get a new car? Um, long story short, between Linda and what he's going to talk about, they're going to pretty much cover most of the questions that people usually have with EVs. Um, the most common questions with EVs are maintenance, are charging, are charging. Did I mention charging? Um, people have a lot of questions on charging. They think it's going to take them 48 hours to charge this car and this and that. And depending on how you plan to charge that car, that is correct. 
there is a good way to own an EV. There's a bad way to own an EV, just like there's a good way to have a window air conditioner and there's a bad way to have a window air conditioner. Um, there are do's, there are don'ts. There's a little bit extra thinking, but there's a little bit extra thinking if you came from a gas to a diesel as well, or if you come from a diesel to a gas as well. So it's not that it's a better or worse fuel. It's not that um, it ha doesn't have a place. It simply has a different place than say gasoline, diesel, electric, that kind of thing. Um, so what I'm going to touch on today ultimately is, is benefits to purchasing an EV. Um, I don't think anybody's talked about maintenance of an EV vehicle here whatsoever. Um, so I'll touch on that a little bit and kind of go from there. If we have time at the end, maybe a question or two, I guess we'll see. Um, so everybody always talks about, and obviously nowadays with inflation the way it is, tax benefits. There are vehicles out there that do have the ability to have a $7,500 tax credit or some have a little bit less than that. Some hybrids have somewhere in there, you know, 4250, that kind of thing. So you do have some benefits, financially speaking, to um, buy an EV. And the one part that Linda didn't touch on with the charging is the cost to charge the car. Um, in Sheboygan County, at least, all of us that have Alliant, um, Alliant offers something called nights and weekends charging rates. So what that means is rather than having your standard 18 cents a kilowatt across the board, um, they actually give you the ability to have, you know, at night, it's going to be less expensive. During peak times during the day, it's going to actually be more expensive. And then in kind of your off times, it's going to end up being the same price as it would normally be. What people don't realize is my house, for example, averages about 1.6 kilowatts per hour of ambient use. Meaning in my everyday life, my house uses about 1.6 kilowatts of power per hour to run the AC, the well pump, the furnace fan, all that kind of stuff, the lights the kids leave on, you know, the bathroom fan that runs for three days straight, the hair straightener that's on the counter all day, that kind of stuff. So 1.6 kilowatt hours of power is the average. The car that I drive holds 100 kilowatts of power, meaning the car that I drive holds two, three, four days of power at a time. So when you charge that car from empty to full overnight, you're using four days worth of power in six hours. Sounds like a lot, but when it's half the price of your normal electricity, because from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., it's seven cents a kilowatt to power that car, to charge that car. So now instead of paying $18 to charge my car during the day, I'm paying seven, seven and a half at night, which is kind of a cool thing. Uh, her car that she drives has a 75 kilowatt battery. Smaller car doesn't need as much power to propel it just as far. At that point, she's spending, what, five bucks at night overnight to charge that car, which is kind of nice. How far can you realistically go in your car? Well, it stays uh, 230, but again, the temp depends on temperature sure. and depends on weather. I right. mean, it depends on... Um, so let's say you know, a 25% you know, loss. What, what the road conditions are. Let's say you can go 175 miles for five bucks. That's, yeah. The math makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's less than two gallons of gas nowadays. And even if you're driving a Toyota Prius, which gets 50 miles a gallon, but you have to drive a Prius, um, <laughs> that's going to take you 100 miles for the same price. So f dollars wise, it makes a lot of sense to drive the EVs. There's no oil changes because there's no oil. You do have some small maintenance. You got to rotate your tires every once in a while. EVs weigh a little bit more. Um, so you're going to have a little bit faster tire wear once depending on your driving habits. Um, so rotate your tires. Uh, you're going to save on your brake pads because there is no use of the brake pads very often. Uh, most of the EVs have what's called one pedal driving. Uh, we were talking earlier today, he has his Tesla parked out there, the nice beautiful red one. Um, you have one pedal driving, meaning as you're letting off that accelerator, it kind of feels like your engine braking in a uh, manual vehicle. You let off the gas, but your engine's still engaged, so you're slowing down. Same thing in an EV, you let off that gas pedal, it's gonna slow you down, not using the brakes putting power back in that battery, so you're saving your power, but at the same time, you're saving your brakes. So there are times that I think Tesla rates their brake pads to 150,000 miles, and that's just a check, because most people don't need to replace them at that mileage because they use them very little. At the same time, they do have massive brakes because they are heavy vehicles. Um, what else did I say I was gonna to touch on? <laughs> yeah, there's no emissions, there's no issues that way. Um, most of the questions I always get are about charging. Obviously, we sell these things. We sell, I sell Honda, Toyotas, and Subarus where we work. Um, the biggest question anybody ever has is charging. How can I charge it? Where can I charge it? Uh, is it? How long does it take to charge it? 
Uh, he's going to touch on most of that kind of stuff. Um, but realistically speaking, I've had my car in Florida. I've had it in Austin, Texas. I've had it to Tennessee quite a few times. Um, we just took it to uh, South Dakota last year. There's charging. It's out there. You have to know there's apps to look for. PlugShare is a great one. I think it's the best one out there. But it'll tell you where you can charge, if the charges are available a lot of times. Um, it's way more feasible to drive an electric car than you'd think. People always assume you have to be, uh, you have to like the, the go green and you know, you have to want to save the environment to drive an EV vehicle. Truthfully speaking, that's not why I drive an EV. I love the environment, it's great. However, that was 0% of my decision to drive an EV, zero. Um, it's great, it's an added bonus, but the reason I drive an EV is because I love to drive. And when I can go 320-ish miles in my car for a $7.50 charge, that to me is fantastic. I can drive, I'm gonna use the example on Sunday. On Sunday, I'm gonna leave Sheboygan. I'm gonna drive to Fond du Lac, I'm gonna drive to Oshkosh, then up through Appleton to Green Bay and then back home. And it's gonna cost me less than seven bucks because I'm gonna do that on less than a charge. So at that point, I'm gonna drive around for the whole day, I'm gonna plug it in at home Sunday night, and I'm gonna wake up Monday morning full as can be and ready to go back to work and not even have to think about it. Um, not to mention, an EV vehicle keeps you on a quick trip. That's an added financial savings. You don't have to go there, you charge at home. So you don't have to pick up those breakfast sandwiches. But as a whole, I bought it because it's fun. They're fast, they're fun to drive, they're inexpensive to fuel. Um, and ultimately, it's simply a different fuel. People say, yeah, you can't just go fill up in 15 minutes. But you can fill up every day without thinking about it. And that's the part I think people don't, don't realize. My car will go 320 miles without charging. How often do you drive 320 miles in one day? You may do it here and there, and that's what fast charging is for. But as a whole, you don't drive 320 miles in a day. You don't drive 175 miles in a day. Milwaukee and back is not 175. You know, so at that point, you plug it in at night, you never have that additional thought. As a whole in my life, charging, I think about it 5% of the time, because as a whole, I just do it at night, I back the car in, I plug it in, I go inside, just like I do my cell phone when I wake up at night. You had a question? No. So the only reason, so they, they call it idle fees. And what that is ultimately is, is it's incentive to, for people to get their car off the charger when it's done. So and that's a, it, it's not just, public. yes, that's public charging um, because there are limited chargers. So in Sheboygan, we have eight Tesla chargers, for example. And if they are more than 50% full, meaning there's four or more cars charging currently at those chargers and your car is there not charging, but still plugged in, they charge that fee. I have actually on accident one time, uh, we took a small trolley in Kentucky um, so to go see a, a site uh, from this gas station. They had a trolley. Well, the trolley ended up breaking down. So now I couldn't get back to unplug my car. Well, luckily for me, there wasn't more than 50%. This, this charging bank had 12 chargers um, and there, I was the fifth car there. So I was there for 17 minutes, not charging anymore. I upped it to 100 just to take on the extra power because why not? Um, and I didn't get charged anything because it wasn't more than 50% full. So that's kind of the big thing there is it's just public. At home, I plug in all the time. Like she said, a plugged in EV is a happy EV because that gives the car the extra power it may need. Uh, in Tesla world, for example, it's going to activate your battery heaters in, in, in the winter um, and, and keep that battery nice and warm. So when you do need to drive, you actually have closer to your summer range available because it kept your battery warm. Um, it can also go ahead and the battery management system can, you know, test your voltages and that kind of thing as well and make sure your cells are topped off to where they need to be. But no, that's just public. Can I make another comment? Sure. The heater in, a, in, a, in my Tesla, the heater um, <clears throat> takes charge, but it heats the car right away. Whereas mm -hmm. in a gas-powered car, you have to wait for the engine to warm up mm -hmm. so that it's, you know, four to ten minutes before yep. you finally... Yeah get heat in the car and they can defrost your windows? Yeah, you'll have heat within 30 seconds of firing up the heater usually just because, again, it's just electric heat, so it's, yep. it's instant. So that's pretty much all I have. Go ahead. Uh, I know well, a lot of you have, have a question yet? Yeah. Yes.
Well, there are two options there. Um, why don't you repeat the question? So the question ultimately <laughs> was, is what happens if you run out of battery between chargers, whether or not it be you haven't been watching, you didn't realize, or your battery, your car loses charge faster than normal. Um, as a whole, I would say the preventative option is your best option, and most manufacturers have taken that into account. Um, I'm going to use Tesla as the example because we've talked about it over here, and it's what I personally drive. Um, basically, I'm going to say as far as, at least in Tesla world, use your GPS because the car is going to estimate based off of temperature outside, weather, wind, and elevation what you're going to arrive at that next charger or what charge state you're going to arrive at that next charger at. Realistically speaking, it's accurate within 1, 2, 3% on a full charge. So if you're at 100% and it says you're going to make it to some place at 5%, I would make that drive and feel confident, truthfully. And again, I've driven these things a lot. They're a lot more precise than you have on a gas vehicle as far as your range estimations um, because it's going to adjust in real time. That car is actually going to take your driving habits, your driving styles, how you are in the accelerator, the speeds that you drive on the highway, and it's going to take um, the elevation you're going to be driving on because it has the GPS, it knows the temperature outside, it has internet, so it's going to know the weather that's coming up, and it actually factors all that in. Obviously, there are unforeseen circumstances, but they're very few and far between. <coughs> if the car says, I'm going to arrive at the charger at 5%, usually, unless something changes, you're going to arrive within 2 to 3% of that. If you do happen to run out to answer your direct question, it's the same thing as a gas car. Of You're out of fuel. The car won't move under its own load. <coughs> so you could tow it. You could bring fuel to it. But it is a little bit harder to bring fuel to an electric car because you, now you need a generator, which depending on how big that generator is, is going to take this amount of time or this amount of time. And to bring a large generator that could charge it fast is ultimately the size of a pickup truck bed. They exist. There are companies that do it. The easy option around here is tow it. Tow it to a charger. Personally, I'm going to knock on something wood here. Is that wood? I don't know. I have never run out. I've come real dang close. I was in Hannahsville, Kentucky. I was zoning out because Tesla was driving. And all at once, there went my exit. I look at my charge state. I have 2% left. And my uh, GPS just rerouted to a seven mile reroute as the quickest way to that charger. So I dropped my speed a little bit. The car literally said, you're not gonna make it at the current speed. Dropped to 60 miles an hour. So I did and I made it. I rolled in at 0%, wasn't in limp mode. I still had power. Um, I plugged in and all was well. So the cars are pretty intelligent. The cars kind of, the biggest thing I tell people when they pick it up an EV is listen to the car. Listen to the car. So a catastrophic issue, a snowstorm, a traffic jam. Sure. So what you're saying is if it goes dead, you're going to have to get it towed. Does AAA have to have chargers on their vehicles? They don't. Not in the Midwest right now, no. Uh, east and West Coast, there are companies out there that do have vehicles that their sole purpose is charging EVs. Um, they carry big generators that charge just as fast as fast chargers out there. Um, they're not cheap, but they do have that out there. Um, to the snowstorm thing, I usually sit, like she said, around 50 or, or higher. She likes 50 or lower, but I do a lot of driving. Um, I drive about 25 to 30,000 miles a year. Um, and as a whole, the majority of that charging is either done at home or work just because it's where I have the car parked. Um, most of your power, the majority of that power is used to propel the vehicle. Although heat, air conditioning, you know, the auxiliary, you know, music and that kind of stuff do use some power. The amount of power that that uses in comparison to physically just propelling the vehicle is very low. So if you do get stuck in a traffic jam, the only time I've ever been in my car for an extended period of time, not while charging, but while sitting in there using the heat, I picked a buddy of mine up from the Milwaukee airport uh, last winter. It was probably five degrees Fahrenheit out. Um, and I was there for about two hours waiting, watching Netflix sitting. I was comfortable, the heat was running, I was doing what I wanted. I even had the window open for a nice little cold breeze, which is super efficient. Um, and I used, two, I used about a percent an hour. So realistically, yeah, but it's, it's not a lot you're losing sitting there if you're in traffic. Thank you, Taylor. I got one last question for him. So a lot of EVs have really impressive specs or whatever. If any of these people wanted to test drive some of your EVs, sure. where could they go? Whoa, that's a good question, Jared. So I work at International Autos here in Sheboygan where we have three EV models. No, Honda, Toyota, and Subaru each have an EV model. Um, we have one of each right now, actually, if you want to come step by. 
I always tell people free test drives, but seriously, if you want to drive an electric vehicle, if you want to drive my car, I have a Tesla Model S, stop by, come see me in the Subaru showroom, that's cool. I just want people to drive them, to see them, to feel them. We have a demo demonstration model of each of them. So if you want to drive an EV, if you want to feel that one pedal driving, we have the vehicles there. Growing up, I was told that electric vehicles would be impossible, but here we are about 20 years later and we have a parking lot full of EVs. Why is that? That's because of everyone in here today. So can we get a round of applause for you guys? <laughs> Over the years, there have been a lot of arguments saying that EVs won't make it, they don't work, or whatever. But I think we are making dreams come true and there's nothing really wrong with electric vehicles. There's a few things out there that are problematic, but they're very quickly going away. What there is problem with, though, is the infrastructure in which we charge them at. I cannot own an EV because I cannot charge it at home, and there's not enough public infrastructure where I can routinely charge it where, as if uh, I had a gas car and I routinely fueled it with gasoline. Reason for that is because I don't have a driveway. I don't have the ability to charge at home. So when I realized this, I started my own startup company, Dreamcatcher Energies LLC, so I can build the infrastructure that I want to see and use. There is a little bit of infrastructure out there, but a lot of it is problematic in many different ways. In fact, I have a 34-slide presentation on the different problems with EV charging infrastructure, but I'm not going to go through that one today. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. Instead, I'm going to run you through the different uh, charging plug types that EVs use. So as we know, EVs are rising, they're here. Most of the time, we're going to be charging at home. Uh, and then if you want to travel far, that's when you're going to be using public charging. If you cannot charge at home, if you live in an apartment complex or you have a power outage, then you will rely on public char charging. And you'll just do that routinely, again, as you would with gasoline. There's three different levels of charging. Level one charging is your standard 120 volt outlet and that can well take over 24 hours to charge an EV. Level two charging is 240 volts, and that can take four to eight hours, twice the voltage, about four times as quick. Massive difference, but that's still kind of a long time. Perfect for overnight charging, or if you're gonna be at work for eight hours and your car's gonna be sitting in the parking lot anyway, same with a park. Level three charging is where the magic really happens. On average, you can charge about 30 minutes, but de depending on a lot of different variations. With level two, you have two charging plug types. You have the Tesla designation charger, which is only for Teslas. And then you have the J1772, which is for everything that's not a Tesla. There are adapters, so there's interpolarity between both of these. With level three charging, you have your Tesla, or also known as North American Charging Standard, your CCS, which I believe is the combined charging standard, and then Chademo, which is a Japanese outdated thing here in the United States. It's still very alive in Japan, but quickly dying here in the United States. Different vehicles have different plug types. Tesla superchargers are only for Teslas, meaning if you have a Mustang Mach-E, you cannot use this unless you have an adapter, but the waiting list is a little bit long. They're coming out for Ford. I don't know if they have them for other manufacturers out yet. I believe Rivian does. And then everything that is not a Tesla is gonna probably use the CCS. Chate Mola is used for the Nissan Leaf, Mitsubishi, Outlander plug-in hybrid, and uh, some very, very old ancient EVs out there, such as the Kia Soul EV. So basically, we're going to be looking at the Tesla supercharger and the CCS. Because eventually, a lot of manufacturers are going to be switching to this Tesla supercharger. When you have a fast charger uh, that is not Tesla, this one right here is called Connect. This is a trademarked brand of my company. Connect has both a CCS plug and a Chademo plug on it, so then you can fast charge literally everything except for a Tesla, but wait, there's more. What if we have uh, an adapter that's retractable on the pedestal itself? So then you can also charge Teslas with the adapter. So now this fast charger can literally charge just about everything that can be fast charged. Plug-in hybrids and really old EVs may not be capable of fast charging at all. As a summary, the level two is a 240 volt input and level three is a three phase 480 volt input. It's 
basically what you need to know, level two is more for a long period of time, and level three is quick and fast. There's also different charger setups. Uh, some of them are a lot messier than others. A lot of them you have to wind up the, the, I almost said hose, you have to wind up the charger cable as if it's a garden hose, but then that creates problems with people being lazy and they just don't wind them up. So then you have tripping hazards and equipment damage hazards of people running over the cables. Other setups have retractable cables that automatically pull them up and make everything much nicer. I almost forgot to mention this too. Fast chargers are not all the same. Even if you have the same plug types, uh, the kilowatts may be different. Why are some fast chargers faster or slower than others? Well, this one right here is a 50 kilowatt charger, meaning the maximum output this can give out is 50 kilowatts, even if your vehicle can take 350 kilowatts at one time. So what can we do? We can install higher powered fast chargers. I recommend a minimum of 100 kilowatts, ideally 150 kilowatts or better. Also some uh, charging setups may be compatible for solar and microgrid integration. Maybe that guy's gonna say something about that later. Uh, that's that presentation, but I wanna share a plug share with you guys. So this is a website. The app is much better in my opinion. It's a lot easier to navigate. So if you're thinking about buying an EV and aren't sure about your different plug types, well, now you can see where they are. Let's say uh, we want to own a Nissan Leaf that has a Chademo plug. So I'm going to, they have a lot of filters here, by the way. I'm going to leave the J1772, and I'm going to just mark the Chademo. So now this is saying where all of my Chademo chargers are and J1772. In fact, I'm just going to show the Chatty Mall. This is all of them in Wisconsin. What's this one? Kohler. Mm -hmm. This is restricted. This is for employees only, which is not a bad thing because I have an entire, where is it? I have an entire presentation on EV charging in the workplace, which I'm also not going to go into too much. <laughs> So making your trips around Wisconsin can be a little tricky with the J1772. Now let's add CCS1 and also Tesla. And we'll also add in our J1772. Wow, that expands that quite a bit. Here we have the Tesla superchargers at Festival Foods. We have, uh, what's this one? Oh yeah, the hotels over by the Southside Walmart have J1772. We have, uh, CCS over at one of our dealerships, but still not too many. What my company focuses on is installing chargers at commercial places, businesses, parks, municipalities, etc. Not so much the home chargers themselves. Uh, I can install in charging or apartment complexes grocery stores, hotels, there's a lot of businesses that can benefit from hosting these. So if you own a business and are looking for some more revenue and traffic, hit me up. I think that's all I have unless someone has some questions. When you install at businesses, is that oftentimes like a gas pump thing where they make some money off of the charge? It can definitely be set up in that fashion. Uh, I'll flex to whatever the business wants or needs. So some businesses do have their chargers set up so they give away free charge. Others you pay with a credit card. So my name is Mike Cornell. I'm with Arch Solar. I'm the chief instigation officer. That means I instigate, perpetuate, and instigate, perpetuate, and perpetrate. Um, with me joining us today is Sierra Neiman, Shella Pockner, and Keith Conway is out there somewhere, as, lo as well as Larry Schmidt with the Cybertruck. So I'd like to give those guys a hand for participating. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of our company. We've been doing solar out of Plymouth for about 20 years, 21 actually. Um, these are the owners, Ed and Mindy. We are a certified women business uh, enterprise. We are a, uh, Mindy is our CEO. Um, we're a family business. We've got a second generation following us. 
And um, our, our mission is to educate, um, inspire, and empower current and future generations to adopt clean, clean energy, sustainable energy. Um, our, here's our mission and our values. Again, I'm going to kind of hustle through this to make sure that this is our service area. We basically go from Green Bay down to the Illinois border on a, on, on a northeast and north, southwest axis. Um, this is our building, and I show this because we have one two-port Tesla charger, another two-port Tesla charger, and a Clipper Creek Tesla charger. So Arch has the ability to boast that we have the most chargers per capita in Sheboygan County, which is kind of ironic um, given the companies we have. Here's our building on the top left with uh, 44 kW maybe of solar. Um, and then this is our fleet. The red car is mine, the blue car is Mindy's, and then that's a Chevy Bolt that we used to have, Bolt with a B. It's, it's uh, been replaced with a Model 3. Um, Jared did a great job explaining the types of chargers, and um, so I'm not going to go through that. In, th in fact, your uh, graphics are fantastic, so thank you for covering all of that stuff. Um, I will add, uh, the, the, so the Level 3 charger is really interesting, and Linda, you probably have experience with this as well, and your analogy is fantastic with the cup and the pitcher. When I plug into a Level 3 Tesla charger, with low power in, left in my car, maybe 15 to 20%, I'm charging at over 500 miles an hour, which is fantastic. It just pushes that power in. However, when it gets to about 80, 85%, it goes down to about 150. And I don't have any patience, so I usually leave by that time. <laughs> Here is a picture of my house um, with uh, 7.4 kW of solar. That's my car plugged in, and that's my screen showing that I'm charging at my house. Here's a picture of my garage. I have three Tesla power walls. So each of those power walls is 13 and a half kilowatt hours of storage. So if I basically charge the batteries from my solar and then let the solar charge of the battery go into my car and run my house, so I basically never buy any power or gas. This is, uh, Jared showed this. Um, or reference this, this is Sheboygan. Uh, Jared referenced this as well, well done. Um, and then I'll just kind of piggyback on what Linda talked about. Low maintenance, tires, brake pads, HEPA filters, wiper fluid, that's all I've done in 147,000 miles on my current car and my previous car at 80,000 miles. No oil changes, charge at home, charge at work. We have free charging at Arch, obviously, because we have solar. We have no exhaust, no repair, no radiator coolant, no gas, and no leaks on the garage floor. Re leaks on the garage floor is probably the biggest thing that pisses people off about ice cars. <laughs> and it doesn't happen with an EV. Population, we didn't talk about this yet, so I'll touch on this. The population of EVs in the United States in 2021 is 1.3 million. 2022, it was 2.0 million. In 2023, it's, according to Edmonds, it's 3.3 million, and the projection is by 2030, 30 to 40 million cars on the road will be electric vehicles in America. My last slide, I think. I drove down to Key Largo last January and used the Tesla charging network the whole way, 1,700 miles. Absolutely seamless. Never skipped a beat. I didn't have to wait, 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 or I didn't have to put up with any inconveniences. Um, I actually found that Bucky's is a really cool place to charge because they got a, an amusement park there <laughs> while you're charging. And that's all I have.